I didn't actually know there'd be this many people here, but uh, this has been kind of a repeating uh, topic. We've heard several uh, talks this week about uh, siloed or stovepipe systems and how they're problems uh, in enterprises. Um, and so I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I've not given this talk before in public, so uh, bear with me if I uh, do a little heavy scripting. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you that hopefully most of you are involved in some sort of integration, right? Could I see a show of hands? Okay. Uh, if you have experience in that space, and I think just about everybody here does, um, don't you just love it when a customer comes to you with their most difficult integration problem and it just so happens that you happen to have the expertise on your team to be able to solve all those problems, this connectivity problem to say, yes, we can make that work. Oops, sorry. Yes, we can make that work, no problem. Um, I want to leave you with an assertion today that we've found that uh, if you develop a team that's competent with WSO2's products and the features, that you can approach any integration problem with the confidence that you, that you can tell your customer that, okay? Uh, here's a brief synopsis of my uh, talk. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our company and then talk about the stovepipe enterprise systems uh, characteristics a little bit. And then I'm gonna share with you a method that we have used uh, to, to begin to migrate a large enterprise uh, towards a, uh, from a stovepipe systems conundrum into a uh, SOA enterprise. And then, of course, this is a WSO2 conference, so I'm going to share with you uh, some detail about uh, some of the products that we've used along this uh, journey and uh, specific lessons that we've learned from them. First of all, uh, Eagle Technology Group, uh, we specialize in information technology engineering and integration enterprise architecture, virtualization solutions, and data center operations. Our team uses a modified Agile Scrum development methodology to deliver high quality, responsive web applications and can address all aspects of design, development, deployment, and maintenance services. We're able to address any facet of infrastructure, data, services, application, and or user experience required to deliver secure, reliable, sustainable, and cost-effective solutions to larger commercial and government organizations nationwide. And our team has excellent past performance and deep experience with business process modeling, architecture frameworks, .NET, Java, and JavaScript te technologies. We are a WSO2 preferred partner, as uh, Narosh mentioned, and we also partner with other industry leaders such as Microsoft. We like to brag that we bring an average of over 18 years of technology experience per employee to every engagement, and we also stay connected with new technology developments. And I cannot go without saying that uh, Eagle Technology is owned by the Native American Modoc tribe of Miami, Oklahoma, and as such, we are a small business administration certified 8A entity. Uh, but to get to get back to the topic today, as I mentioned, many of our customers uh, are large U.S. government organizations. And as such, we've been given the dubious pleasure of seeing and working on systems that are many times the result of decades of disjointed, broken, and software development practices and acquisition processes that have, in many cases, spiraled far beyond reason. These organizations have been stifled by years of stovepipe systems development using corresponding stovepipe funding processes. Now when I use the term stovepipe, this of course is something most of you are familiar with. Uh, it can also be called siloed systems. It's a derogatory term, one that indicates that a system has far greater uh, data and functionality sharing potential that's not being realized. I like to focus on the word potential here in this definition because it says to us that the system going forward isn't worthless. It doesn't necessarily require a greenfield uh, redefinition of the system. But the, the issue is that we have to find a way to take that system and bring its value into the enterprise. Uh, furthermore, some properties of the stovepipe enterprise systems. We're talking about systems that have primarily been developed with ad hoc architectures. Um, the only planning for interoperability uh, between them is those interfaces that are already in existence, 
uh, they generally take the form of multiple systems in an enterprise that uh, are designed independently from each other at just about every level. Many of the systems have been uh, produced using incompatible technology, disparate development approaches, and various technologies in their final implementation uh, even. And uh, business centers uh, have been focused on making sure that their specific business functions were developed instead of ensuring that they're delivering value to the enterprise. Now this has made integration difficult, uh, and one might say practically even impossible in some cases. Uh, integration planning, as I mentioned, if any, uh, we were lucky to find it with our one particular uh, instance that I'm talking about. I can't mention any agency names or particulars today, but uh, we were fortunate that they had done uh, some integration at the data modeling layer. And so we had somewhat of an enterprise data model where we at least had some data sharing going on. We had common reference data that uh, various systems were using. And we used this as an impetus to help build a pathway towards a, migrated, a migration to a SOA enterprise. So how did Eagle Technology Group use these standards developed at the data modeling layer to start getting away from the stovepipe enterprises? Well, we first wanted to show our customers that they needed to change the software development and deployment method in order to start migrating to a distributed software mindset that featured services. And although the movement to uh, services had been mandated for nearly a decade, uh, a lot of system managers simply didn't understand the services-oriented architecture, and so most didn't change their methods correspondingly. Uh, some had started to use services, but the full distributed application development migration had not been taking place in, in, in large part. Um, so we needed a fairly simple way to show them how to begin this migration using a small bit of functionality that was uh, due to be changed, that, that they had uh, asked to be changed. And so we, we began by first developing a proof of concept of about a dozen individual prototype systems um, using a, uh, where was I? Using a, uh, a modern web UI development kit which we had built in house. Uh, this web kit uh, was based on HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript sort of a customized version of Twitter Bootstrap, if any of you have experience with that. But these prototypes showed how quickly a set of legacy systems could be refaced using a modern UI development kit with a common look and feel. And while those initial prototypes were mocked uh, with some of the functionality, we simultaneously had uh, middle and back-end service developers create real web services that encapsulated business logic um, based on an enterprise uh, data model that we were talking about before. And then we needed to link those services into the legacy components with the middleware. The role of WSO2 in all of this was to provide a viable platform, uh, the impetus to actually begin providing identity management, service hosting, service authentication and authorization, logging, message mediation, persistence, and integrated data sources using JD, JDBC, all the other industry standards uh, and protocols that you want to use in your enterprise to deliver a business, the business logic capabilities that you want every application in your enterprise to have. And our customer really liked the open source software approach that WSO2 offered. Uh, the Carbon framework made the product set up and integration much quicker and easier than other uh, confabulated uh, combinations that we'd tried in the past with other third-party products. And uh, WSO2 provided for uh, quickly integrating our existing capabilities and best of all, as I mentioned before, no immediate need to greenfield our legacy systems so that the investments uh, in this different methodology could quickly develop uh, some sort of payback for future needs, uh, leveraging the, uh, the, the systems that we had in place already. So we began evaluation of just about every product that WSO2 had in their suite at the time, and uh, we've since used and fielded to date many of their products. Uh, we, um, their products played a crucial role in us being able to deliver real distributed software like we had previously only been able to mock with the prototypes. And uh, just a few of the benefits and valuable lessons that we learned during our evaluations and subsequent implementations 
include the fact that we love that WSO2 provides a mature, robust, and very flexible and powerful platform for trying out this whole distributed app uh, enterprise technologies for uh, organizations that previously had no experience in this space. Uh, we love that the company uh, itself uh, is agile, flexible, and open to suggestions. They, uh, they want your feedback and ideas, and they've been very receptive uh, to helping us out and, and listening to uh, our concerns and interests. Uh, we also like that the company keeps their tech very current and they're very forward thinking, if you haven't already gathered that from uh, the conference this week. They're not afraid to switch out a component's underlying technology if something better comes along. And so after our evaluations of all the WSO2 products, we selected six for uh, this, this first customer, customer of ours that was a, a large enterprise. Uh, the ESB the identity uh, server, the API manager, and then the supporting products of the message broker, the GREG, and then uh, application server, data services ser server uh, combination. Uh, I want to break down the salient features of each one of these just a little bit in the role that it played in our decision to include it in our solution. Uh, with the ESB, we use this to provide our, our message translation that allows all the mixed technologies to, to communicate, all the different data sources that we have that may be housed with different database platforms, uh, services that may be written in .NET or CXF or Access or whatever. We can use the, the mediation capabilities, the ESB, to get all these to work together. So it gives us a centralized proxy server that also allows us to apply common security and authorization to all of our service calls, does our service request routing and logging, and we're going to soon be applying our data analytics to this. Uh, it also allows us the flexibility to be able to move the back-end services around anywhere in the enterprise without requiring any code changes on the front end. And that was something that was just, it was amazing to us. We were still finding uh, applications and services that actually had IP addresses for back-end services that were in operation. And so we've been able to get rid of those. Uh, and uh, let's see. And the last thing that we love is that uh, we're able to redeploy the artifacts once they're developed in a development environment. They can encapsulate all the ESB artifacts together into what they call a carbon uh, archive, a car file, and you can re redeploy those same artifacts to, from your dev to your testing to your uh, staging and production environments with very little changes, if any, uh, required. Moving on with the uh, identity server, uh, we're capturing enterprise level user information that's uh, going to be used in all of our legacy and transition development. And uh, this is really interesting because uh, your customers may already have a federated uh, system solution or single sign-on solution, uh, which was the case for our customer. But we found that with the identity server in front of it, we could still capture that user information uh, and create a record of those users, what uh, WSO2 calls their just-in-time provisioning. So it provisions a, a record of the user, and then uh, any time that they're authenticated with their additional uh, with their separate federated system, they're authenticated back into the system. If there are any changes to that user record, it's automatically updated in the WSO2 uh, identity server's user store. Um, and also the WSO2 identity server uh, is a highly flexible identity management toolbox. It's already able to work with all sorts of commercial standard user account databases, such as anything that uses LDAP, uh, like Active Directory, we had a case of a customer who had already invested in a non-standard uh, federated system application. This required us to expand the identity server's capability by adding a custom callback authenticator plugin uh, to leverage that customer's existing single sign-on capability. And uh, my partner, uh, Greg Streetman, here from Eagle Technology, gave a presentation at the last WSO2Con about how to build one of those. Okay, then with the API manager, although we've had uh, limited fielding of API manager instances so far, we want to migrate our development teams uh, towards using this. And with our initial uh, rollout, it was a crucial piece of the architecture that we implemented because 
number one, out of the, ba out of the box, it uh, applies OAuth 2.0 security to all the, all the service calls by default without any custom configuration. Uh, OAuth 2.0 scopes provide simple role-based authorization management with uh, minimal configuration needed. And uh, the API manager also allows you to apply throttling to uh, either application levels, which can be combined of individual APIs or the, the uh, resources themselves that are contained within the APIs. So it's very flexible with the different throttling levels that you can apply. Um, and it allows you to also secure services from over, overuse, just a basic denial of service uh, to prevent denial of service type of, uh, of hits against your, uh, your API calls. Uh, and then the monitoring identifies your application users and the frequency of API subscription and use to help you uh, look at where your resources are being used, which uh, APIs might need to be sundowned or you know, other ones that might need to be given more resources. Excuse me. With the WSO2 message broker, uh, we feel like this should be considered uh, in any large stateless message-based system when you need to guarantee message delivery. Uh, we found this to be crucial in an implementation to an upgraded capability that we had uh, in a system that had a new database and schema that went with our uh, prototype front end that we were building, but at the same time, uh, we were keeping alive the legacy system, which also needed to be updated with new records or updated records that were being updated through our front end. And we were able to leverage the message broker by using a, uh, uh, some mediation on the ESB for those calls to duplicate those messages, drop them into a message queue, and then we would have a message processor on the ESB that would pick those up out of the message broker and process them through a, uh, a separate query to the legacy database to keep the two in sync. Um, and that explain, <laughs> was what I just basically explained. Uh, one other interesting lesson that we've learned about the message broker over the last uh, two years that we've been using these products is that you can also, if any of you have experience with uh, RabbitMQ, you know that it has a virtual host capability that allows you to isolate uh, message queues and topics uh, by customer. Uh, the Carbon framework that's built into all the WSO2 products has a feature called multi-tenancy that basically allows you to pare down that product into a completely isolated uh, instance, so to speak. So it's sort of a, we like to think of it as a way of scaling down the product. You talk, always talk about scaling up, but with multi-tenancy, you can actually divide up an instance and it gives that particular group of users a totally isolated instance of that product that's housed on, on the same box. Uh, the governance and registry server, um, as I mentioned, because we've seen very immature practices in terms of uh, our customer organization being unfamiliar with distributed artifacts, uh, such as where we're employing distributed components, uh, service WSDLs, waddles, schema versions, endpoints, etc. Uh, our customers aren't generally ready to begin using the full capabilities uh, of the governance and registry server, the governance part. However, uh, we've learned that there are definite benefits to be gained from the registry facet of the GREG server. Uh, we found that the deployment of dynamic endpoints uh, using WSO2's recommended shared configuration registry for ESBs is a great way to cluster components, uh, keeps their, their configuration um, identical, and at the same time, it also allows you to address endpoints completely agnostic to the environment. So basically, you can use a single governance or registry server to host all your endpoints for every environment if your rules allow you to do that. In our government space, we're not able to do that, but it at least allows you to, as I was talking about earlier with the ESB, being able to redistribute those ESB artifacts to different environments and not have to change anything. If you use these dynamic endpoints in a, in a uh, governance and registry configuration, then there's no change whatsoever that has to be made to those. Uh, and, and we certainly, as I mentioned earlier, we can see the need to begin loading other facts, artifacts as uh, WSDLs and WADLs. 
Uh, another registry artifact that we share through the registry is the security policies that we use to provide authorizations for certain groups of services and APIs within the enterprise. And then with the, uh, the application server, the, uh, the application server can actually have the data services uh, server feature added to it so that it basically can become uh, two products in one. And uh, this is a, a, uh, an interesting feature of the, uh, the Carbon framework. Uh, any of you who have ever worked with the Eclipse IDE uh, are familiar with the OSGI framework that the uh, Carbon framework is based around. Um, and it allows you basically all of the features uh, of each and every product are uh, basically just components that are added on top of this framework. Well, you can build your own, so to speak, as long as they're compatible version-wise. And so what we did was, we, with the previous version, we were able to uh, uh, take an application server and add the, the DSS server capabilities to it. Uh, this allowed us to do hosting uh, services, we were able to host apps side by side, uh, both REST and SOAP CXF services. Uh, as I mentioned before, we can host both CXF and Access 2 services all simultaneously, uh, which means that we can support any development team's choice, choice of services development framework. Uh, and we just have to make minor adjustments in the request headers at the proxy services for those servers, or services, excuse me. Um, we're able to use existing database clustered data sources. These can also be referenced from a single server or cluster of app servers while requiring only a single configuration file and driver uh, to connect to the database platform of your choice. And besides the native H2 database engine that WSO2 uses in its products, we've regular, regularly connected a single uh, application server to both Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server uh, data sources as well, and uh, these can reside uh, either on the uh, a development box or, as I mentioned before, in a clustered network environment. Uh, all it takes is a matter of, it's a matter of credentials and uh, addressing to log into them in those configuration files I was talking about. Uh, so that makes it really, uh, really easy to make your development in uh, uh, staging and production environments a lot more alike. You can actually pull in live data for your developers to start working on uh, that looks more like what they're going to see in a production environment and not have to worry about developing test data. Uh, the DSS also allows us, allowed us to very quickly create services tied into those uh, existing uh, database uh, sources uh, very early in the development cycle, which uh, gives the front end developers confidence in the middleware when they can quickly and easily see the data that they're used to seeing in the development environment as opposed to, to some test data. And uh, we found that these services are easiest to build with the data services server if you're uh, building them from reference data or master data sources that are typically returned from a single table or query. But uh, multiple table joins are possible if you're little, they're just a little more complex. And uh, we also, last but not least, like that uh, the actual data sources can be integrated at the service host since the DSS and application server can exist in a single instance. Uh, in development, we have plans to field the, uh, the business process server in the coming year. We already have that uh, work with that going on in our development environment. And as I mentioned earlier, we're going to integrate uh, data analytics across several components the coming year. Uh, we're already, um, we want to start capturing ESB service call events and start doing some uh, tracing with those. Uh, and last, I wanted to say uh, some other, other things that we like about WSO2 is uh, the, uh, the open source uh, nature of their business, using the standard web and internet technologies. Um, Besides that, it's incredible that the same binary that you run on your laptop is the same thing that runs in a production server. Uh, there's no other product or set of products that we know of uh, anywhere in the industry that that's the case. And it really gives you a lot of confidence in what you're doing as a developer, the developer level, that what you're 
what you've got working there in your desktop or even maybe your small development network environment is going to work equally as well in a production environment. And uh, what's equally as in incredible as it says here, it, it, it's, it's not tied to the OS because it, all the WSO2 products are running in a JVM. So your developers might be running a Windows laptop, Apple laptop, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's the, uh, the end components and the artifacts that you're pushing into the products and they're gonna behave exactly the same way. And uh, last but not least is you know, the final feature that they list for the ESB is uh, that you can connect anything to anything and we found that's really, really true. Uh, anything that, uh, that has a, a JDBC connector for data you can talk to, any other components, any of the standard web protocols and if you have a custom product of some sort that you need to talk to, all the products are extendable as well as long as you have uh, capable, viable Java programmers on staff that are able to do that. We've actually downloaded the source code of many products, built them in-house. We've learned a lot about uh, some of the products that we didn't know from the documentation by looking through the source code. So it's helpful to have that, but uh, not necessary.